A while ago, I made a video on my French channel for supercars that you could buy for under 50,000 euros. I ended up saying at the end of that video that I was going to buy one of those cars, and that ended up happening. I bought myself an Audi R8. <laughs> Today is the return of that kind of video, and we're going to be talking about good supercars to invest in, potentially, for under 100,000 euros. Now, we're doing this in euros because I'm currently in France, and we filmed it for my French channel as well. Um, but, you know, the same rules apply in general for anything in pounds. Of course, I just want to say, you know, I'm not a, a massive expert in this. This is just from having been sort of around cars, having uh, been involved in a few deals, brokering car deals, and just being obsessed with constantly looking at what's on the market, what the market is doing. These are a few cars that I see potentially being safe in terms of holding their value and maybe even potentially going up in the future but of course the market can shift as a whole which means that independent models are just affected by that and you never know especially in a time as sort of unpredictable as today so just want to say that as a little intro but now let's get into it we're gonna be looking at five cars for under hundred thousand euros first car is the Aston Martin DBS now there are a few things that we're gonna be looking out for with uh, these cars one of which is coming from a recognizable brand uh, historically the ones that kind of do the best are Porsche and Ferrari but then a brand like Aston Martin does have potential as well Lamborghini potentially Mercedes some of the German other German guys so Aston Martin kind of ticks that box another box that's great to be ticked is a naturally aspirated engine no turbos no supercharger nothing of the type that helps because that's becoming a more and more rare breed the more cylinders you can have to that natural aspiration the better this here is a naturally aspirated v12 so we're kind of ticking all of those massively and then the ideal is to also have a manual gearbox because again that is another dying breed so if you can get all of those things tick you're looking pretty good if you can on top of that have history behind the specific model if it's a remake of an old model or it's just famous for another reason like it being in a film that helps massively as well now this car right here the DBS was actually in James Bond I believe it was Casino Royale so the DBS I'm going to be showing you guys examples of cars for sale in Europe for every single model that we talk about this one in front of us right here is a car from 2008 it's got 44,000 kilometers now people didn't actually stack miles on their DBS is too too much because it was kind of a much more rare much more expensive slightly more hardcore version of a DB9 so most people who are going to stack miles on got a DB9 now obviously it's a very 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 pretty car it was available with a single clutch flappy panel gearbox actually as an option or standard with a manual a lot of people opted for the flappy paddles because that was kind of the thing when it came out back in 2008 so yeah there aren't that many in manual and it's a very cool manual gearbox as well it's kind of this like iRobot looking gear shifter it's, it's, it's really cool now it's a great looking car obviously it's got all the history it's ticked all the boxes and another thing which is great now is that the remake of this car the modern DBS the Super Legera is not available in a manual and it's a turbocharged V12 so when you add all those things together it kind of ticks all the boxes maintenance wise it's an Aston fairly expensive to maintain it's obviously got a big V12 drinks quite a bit of fuel it's got carbon ceramic brakes so it's not gonna be the cheapest car to maintain and it is is fairly expensive to buy especially in manual you already see a big premium on the manuals compared to the cars with the single clutch this one falls just under the hundred thousand euro mark at ninety nine thousand nine hundred forty one so yeah we're only 39 euros away from our budget cap but um, it is a car that i see is you know going down in history potentially more as a long-term investment it's not one that's going to jump massively very very quickly but a car that definitely ticks a lot of those boxes and i think is one that you're not going to lose a huge amount on i mean you know who knows if you're going to win you know and and it kind of skyrocket in value nobody really knows but i think you know you're fairly safe in buying a manual dbs so that's our first car of course there are others i could talk about that fall within the price bracket that are also from aston martin so please comment down below any other cars and if you want us to make more of these videos i mean the the vanquish not the last gen but the gen before that vanquish is definitely a good investment with a manual the v12 vantage with a manual is also a good investment that falls in this price bracket but obviously we're going to try and vary them a bit rather than just get all cars of the same type so aston martin i actually chose the dbs because that's my personal favorite. We're now going over to Porsche. Porsche, very confusing system in terms of naming their cars, generations, etc. We're going to be focusing on the 997 Turbo today. So today we're actually in the 992 generation. There was a 991 generation just before that, of which there was the 991.1 and 991.2, which was a facelift. And today we're going to be focusing, as I said, on the 997s. Now there are two generations of those as well. The 0.1, the 0.2. Obviously a facelift is the 0.2. And we're going to be focusing on the turbos. The reason I've 
chosen this car is because the 997 generation turbo is the last Porsche 911 turbo that was ever made with a manual and the legendary Mesca engine. So that's one of the reasons why I've chosen this. The ultimate one for me, I think, would be the 997 second generation Turbo S with a manual, very, very rare, very pretty, extremely powerful car, um, but they're very hard to find. Uh, I saw two pop up on the market not too long ago. One had a terrible spec, the other had way too many miles. So it's, it's pretty hard to find one of those. You just need to kind of keep an eye out. But to give you some numbers, to give you an idea why those are so much more expensive, there were 25,001 Porsche 997 turbos made through 2005 to 2013, through all the generations. Now, 19,201 of those were the first generation turbo cars. Now, obviously, this is worldwide numbers. 3,800 of those were the 3.8 liter Gen 2 cars, and then only 2,000 were Gen 2 turbo S's. And of those, I think only about maybe 500 were manual, if that. So very rare. Now today we're gonna to be focusing obviously because of the budget cap and because of what's available on the market on the Gen 1 Turbo with a manual gearbox. Now this one I found in front of me, very resellable spec, gray exterior, black interior, it's got the carbon ceramics, it's got the manual gearbox, obviously sport chrono package, and it's got the uh, sport seats, which is quite a desirable option, which isn't standard on the turbos. Really, really nice car. It's got those classic first gen turbo wheels. It's kind of ticking all the boxes. This one is going to set you back 85,997 euros. It's got under 50,000 kilometers, which is great for a car of this type. People did stack miles on these because obviously it's such a usable, almost daily driver-esque car. So if you can go under the 50,000 kilometer mark, that is ideal. They're not anywhere near as expensive to run as a DBS would be. Obviously six cylinder engine. It's not naturally aspirated as the name suggests. It is a turbocharged car, um, but Porsches in general are just so reliable that this again could be a good long-term investment because you're not really gonna have to spend too much in the maintenance of the car. You can use it if you want a fair amount. They're not as mileage sensitive and they're never going to make another turbo in manual, I believe, at least for now. None of them are available in manual because the, the, the ethos of the turbo matches the modern day PDK so much better than a manual gearbox would. So you kind of know you're safe in terms of that's not gonna come around again. And I believe that it's going to mean that in the long run, it's a car which again could hold its value quite well and maybe even potentially go up. So that's the second car. Third is one obviously quite dear to my heart. It is an Audi R8 V10 with a manual gearbox. So I obviously picked one of these up about six months ago. So studied the market for these quite a bit. Realized that there's actually a real niche. So they made quite a lot of R8s in manual actually. Obviously always naturally aspirated whether it was the V8, 4.2 liter V8 or the 5.2 liter V10. Um, now there are a few generations similar to what we just discussed with Porsche. Um, Audi R8s there are four generations effectively. There's first gen, first gen facelift, second gen, second gen facelift, which is where we currently are. I think the sweet spot is the first gen facelift because one, I think they look considerably newer, much more modern. And obviously they were then available with a double clutch gearbox, which means a lot more people decided to go for the semi-automated double clutch gearbox rather than with the first first gens when it was Artronic. It was such a shit gearbox that people were basically going for the manual a lot more. So you see a lot less manual facelift cars knocking about, even more so with the V10s, and even more so with the V10 Pluses, because I've been told that it wasn't even an option that you could tick on the V10 Plus. It was something that you had to ask your dealer specific to have your V10 Plus in a manual gearbox. So for example, in the UK, I believe there are only nine delivered, two have since been crashed. There are only seven V10 Plus manuals that are in the UK, and I don't think there's a single one on the market right now. So they are going up in value gradually and probably would not fit under this 100,000 mark anymore. So we're going to go with a normal V10, so non V10 Plus. So this one is obviously got the same engine, but it's setting back 525 horsepower rather than 550. 5.2 liter V10 derived from a Lamborghini Gallardo, which we'll be talking about in a little bit. Now, this one is actually a Spider. In general, coupes are better um, for any of these. The DBS, the Porsche, and the R8. Any kind of car that you're looking to invest in because the soft tops on these cars can corrode pretty easily and need replacing and just in general the system for it will look pretty outdated after a while and be very slow so it's an easy way to tell the age so generally if it's a car that you're looking to 
invest in or not lose too much money in, I'd recommend a coupe. However, there aren't that many on the market. So we're gonna have to make do today for example's sake with a spider. Now this one, yeah, 89,990 euros. It's very resellable spec, white. Now, obviously there are a few things that you got on the V10 Plus, like specific rims and things like that, which you can't get on the standard V10. This one actually has V8 wheels, but one very nice option it's got on the interior, the sport bucket seats with a diamond stitching. Now, really, really nice gated manual gearbox. I can tell you from experience that it's such a satisfying feeling changing gear with that gearbox. Now, people put quite a few kilometers on their cars. I know this mine has 40,000 miles now because they're so reliable and not too expensive to maintain because obviously the parts for them, seeing as they made so many uh, R8 and all they really changed with the lights and stuff, the body panels were still basically the same between facelifted versions. You can get the parts fairly cheap, so it's not too expensive to maintain, very usable, so people stack the miles on. So here we're above 50,000 kilometers, we're at 57,000 kilometers. But that's not too, too bad on these cars because the market has an average mileage, which is quite a lot higher than, for example, with the DBSs. These I see really going up because, you know, I can I can basically count on one hand the cars that have a naturally aspirated V10 linked to a manual gearbox. Really rare sort of configuration, but one of the best. I think V10s are, are some of the greatest engines um, that we've seen on any road cars and having them linked to a manual. I mean, you got the R8, you got the first gen Gallardo, which is another car that fits in this budget potentially, but is a lot more expensive to maintain. You've got uh, Crow GT, obviously not in the budget. Dodge Viper and F10 M5, I believe it was. That was manual as well uh, with a V10. So the, yeah, you don't get many of those, which is why I see these potentially going up in the future. Now the next one is actually kind of a personal favorite of mine. Uh, this is like your guilty pleasure car. Is the Gallardo Superleggera, first generation. I think these are undervalued right now and i think they will probably you know be be going up uh, you know as the years come it's a car that was launched in 2007 at the geneva motor show naturally aspirated v10 very close to the one that's in the audi r8 v10 uh, apart from this one's got 530 horsepower so five horsepower more than the last one we watched and uh, 20 less than uh, the 550 in the v10 plus obviously it's quite a lot older than that car though it's got a single clutch gearbox it's what they call the e-gear to be honest it's, it's a fairly crap gearbox it's really not that good it's much better if you're actually using it in a manual mode because if you leave it in automatic it's really just not very smooth but you know the gallardo is the best selling lamborghini so far about to be overtaken by the urus i believe but uh yeah gallardo they sold massive amounts of those and obviously the most kind of classic one is the first gen car and the super Legeras of that they really did not make a lot of they then facelifted it to the 570 super Legera, made a lot more of those and now the performante obviously i think it's like tenfold more of those that they're making it sounded incredible it was so raw so much carbon all over the place i mean the engine cover the rear wing the the rear view mirrors a side mirror the door panels everything was just covered in carbon beautiful bucket seats such a legendary car and we've seen cars of that type for example i've got a 430 scuderia here which has gone up you know massively and is still going up as well it, very similar kind of car and these seem to be the cars that people kind of edge towards if they want to go back to the cars you can't really get anymore today naturally aspirated so hardcore so raw their experiences that are just so rare now so that's why i think this is going to be one that will hold or go up just about fits in the budget it was the only one i could find that fit in the budget usually they're a tiny bit above this is 99,900 euros and it's got 44,000 kilometers these are fairly mileage sensitive cars the super Legera is a lot more than the standard gallardos but yeah if as long as you're under that 50,000 mile you should be okay but awesome 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 looking cars this one we've got in front of us here obviously in black very resellable spec i think that would be a great car to pick up in in the years to come it wouldn't be a video of this type if you didn't at least mention one ferrari now we're going to be talking about the 360 moderna there's a few you could talk about in this category that fall within the budget the 355 but i'm going to talk about the 360 purely because it was one of the first Ferraris you could kind of daily drive, which was really usable, made out of aluminium, produced in high numbers, and one of the last V8 manuals they made. Obviously the 430 then came out in manual after that. There was the California as well, but the you know, 430 is way out of budget now if you're getting it as a manual. So this is a great car, naturally aspirated V8 around 400 horsepower, and linked to that famous Ferrari gated manual, which they do not make anymore. There is no car coming out 
part from Marinello with a manual gearbox, which is what makes this kind of really special. The one I found here is in yellow, which is not the ideal color you'd go for. Ideally, you want a red car uh, with a tan interior, kind of like Sam seen through glasses. That's the ideal spec. Um, yellow is obviously quite a legendary color with Ferrari, because as you may know, it was Ferrari's color originally. Enzo Ferrari painted the cars in yellow, but then when he started racing in motorsport back in the day, every country was assigned a color and the cars that came out of that country had to wear that color, which for Italy was red, and then it just kind of stuck with Ferrari from there. So it is quite a legendary color. There is a story behind it. Um, the 360 Modena is obviously a great car. Big numbers produced, so they haven't skyrocketed yet. But in the future, I just think all manual Ferraris are a fairly safe bet. This one is at 86,000 euros. You're looking at 35,000 kilometers, which is fairly low. With these, you do need to be careful to have a full service history, ideally potentially even come from a dealer. Just because they are fairly fragile cars, you really want to know they've been well maintained. And because a lot of people daily drove them or beat on them quite a bit, there are a few knocking about that aren't in the best condition. So you need to be fairly careful with these. But as a whole, I think they could be a pretty good idea to, to walk into one. So yeah, I mean, those are five cars. Just real quick overview of those. Let me know down below which of those five you would pick. They're kind of modern classics. We're not going very classic with the cars. You can tell the trend is naturally aspirated when possible, manual when possible, and rare is always a positive thing. So yes, there's a lot of other cars we could talk about which are under this budget. The 355, the Vantages, Z4 M's, E55 AMG's, Supras. There are so many other cars we could talk about. So if you want more of these kind of videos, if you'd like them, you know, under 20,000, under 200,000, future cars to come, please comment down below what kind of thing you would like. Again, this is not my job. I'm not an expert as this. I don't want you to take my advice word for word, but it's just a few things that I kind of potentially see as a trend, which could look pretty good. And it's, so it's more to start a discussion more than try and 100% educate you and tell you what's going to happen with the market because no one really knows. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you again very soon. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye.